Greetings, everyone. For our third installment in our discussion of the Mega Man X series, if you haven't seen parts one and two, I'll leave a handy link in the description below, and you'll be missing out on crucial context if you haven't. If X1 through X3 were the X trilogy, and X4 through X6 were zeros, it's probably safe to say the next three games were a trilogy dedicated to the new arrival of Axel. These games are probably the most radical departure from the games that came before, often for both good and for ill, and while staying true to the Rock, Paper, Scissors gameplay mechanics built upon them in new and interesting ways. Let's start off with the <clears throat> low point of the entire franchise, Mega Man X7. Mechanically, X7 wanted to be a brand new experience in the franchise, and in some ways it was, just not good ways. The gameplay is sluggish by comparison. The lock-on system typically just made things worse, the promised co-op gameplay disappeared sometime in development, and the dubbing was done by the most bored voice actors Capcom of America could find. Also, you have to unlock the titular character and his special armor unlocked from the Easter egg hunt is... boring and dull and kind of dumb. And due to the power-up mechanic that probably looked better on paper than on screen prohibits you from just speeding through this title the way you could the PS1 trilogy via things like Ultimate X or Black Zero. Alright, let's bite into the story. The tale opens some unspecified amount of time after the events of X6, with the disillusioned X retiring from his role as field agent, hoping to support the Maverick Hunters from behind the scenes. Zero remains active, but finds himself constantly in over his head. And meanwhile, Rogue Organization, Red Alert, and its leader, Red, continue to act more or less unchecked, courtesy of their secret weapon, the shape-changing Reploid Axel. However, having grown unhappy with how Red Alert was growing, Axel ignites the events of the game by fleeing Red Alert, only to cross paths with Zero and be taken back to Hunter Base. There, Red contacts them, demanding Axel's return, though understanding his hesitation. So he challenges the Maverick Hunters to a contest of skill, fighting head-to-head -head for Axel's allegiance. While reluctant at first, the Hunters decide there's really no other choice and there could be a problem if left unchecked, so Zero and Axel depart to meet Red Alert head-on. X5 and X6, you can rescue innocent Reploids caught in the crossfire, and many of them will give you different items, including the all-important power-up items which increase a Hunter's stats, broken up into three stats each and requiring 12 power-ups to max out completely. This also means if a bystander is killed in level before you can save them, well, you better load your save because they're gone for good if you just go on. So, let's touch on significant Maverick dialogue. While playing as X, most of the Mavericks just ask if he's been retired or not, but the one curious instance is Tornado Tunyon, who specifically requests that X stop the one known as the Professor, and tries to explain that they're no longer in control of their own actions. Next, X encountering the Berserk Flame Hyenard, has X explain simply that he doesn't want anyone else to have to die, not even an enemy. In Zero's dialogue, we have an interesting exchange with Soldier Stone Kong, who greets Zero enthusiastically with, So you are Zero, the grace of whose attacks is like no other. I am Stone Kong. I live only to fight, just like you. To which Zero counters, there's more to life than fighting. Another curious moment crops up and Zero encounters Snipe Anteater, who says he sees data within Zero, possibly a memory of the past or a moment in the future. Blue, the lies that have infested the Earth. Red, those destroyed and sealed away forever. Zero brushes this off, challenging him by explaining his true mission is to hunt down Mavericks like Anteater himself. Axel's dialogue, quite prolific throughout the game since he and Zero punctuate each Maverick encounter with a small exchange, and he speaks about his shape-changing powers. Key among which, even he doesn't know why he has them in the first place, he just always has. When engaging Mavericks, Axel gets some insight, particularly when he encounters who he called the Great and Wise Stone Kong. Axel point-blank says Red Alert is in the wrong, and Soldier Stone Kong actually agrees with him. Anyway, with the Mavericks destroyed, you engage with Red himself, last man standing of Red Alert, and ultimately defeat him, only to learn that Sigma, of course, was behind it all this whole time. In the end, X, Zero, and Axel have to team up to defeat him and end his rather vaguely defined plot. The issues with X7 are Legion, and let's just touch on the story beats for now. For starters, almost no one's acting in character with how we understand them. X comes off as whiny and petulant, even saying that training someone to be a hunter as good as him is impossible in the end of the game. X is supposed to be an idealist who sees the good in everyone, the bright side to even bad situations, or at the very least the light at the end of very long tunnels. Zero, at least, remains a strong, stoic pillar in the hunter organization, who is quick to remind people, chiefly Axel, who needs to be given blame. 
He even becomes defensive when he's accused of losing sight of his own humanity, showing that he's learned a lot from the past few games. Axel is kind of annoying, if we're just going to be honest. The whiny voice they picked for him doing him absolutely no favors in this regard. And Sigma's plan is vague at best. It's clear he wants the DNA copy ability that Axel can provide and clearly did something with it to make Red Alert members stronger and more prone to going Maverick at the same time. And with the end game here, it's supposed to be a bit uncertain. And Red himself seems like a reasonable enough guy, even admitting the Maverick Hunters won the contest well before the game's over, but a victim of circumstances who finds himself powerless when it mattered the most. It would be a comedy of errors if this game was entertaining. But thankfully, what comes next took the foundations laid by X7 and expanded on it in some big ways. Now, the exact chronology of the games as they come next is somewhat up for debate. Some claiming X8 happens first and others saying Command Mission does. I have no means of proving one or the other, so as an objective means of deciding, I've just opted to cover the games in the release order, meaning that Command Mission comes next. Mega Man X Command Mission, a game I've already reviewed here on Channel Snack, is actually a turn-based RPG, so it's considerably more dialogue-heavy than the games that came before, which helps characterize the radically expanded cast. If you haven't played this game, as with the games I've covered for this segment prior, expect spoilers. Ready? Okay, here we go. A meteorite falls into the Pacific Ocean, and from it, mankind discovers Force Metal, a strange ore with amazing properties where even a small amount can supercharge reploids. In order to mine and process the material, the artificial island of Giga City is built over top the meteor impact area by the Federation government. However, not long after the island fully went into operation, rogue reploid Epsilon gave rise to the Rebellion Army, seeking independence for Giga City as its own nation exclusively for reploid kind. Because history definitely shows this is a great idea and has no downsides whatsoever, just like X4. X0 and new arrival Shadow are dropped into Giga City territory to gather intel on the Rebellion and their intentions, but Shadow's sudden betrayal separates the Hunters and forces X to go from recon to full resistance against the Rebellion. That makes sense in context. Anyway, X soon befriends other like-minded Reploids and brings them to work with his cause, the first of which being Chief R, who acts as head commander of the Resistance in Giga City, and then the bounty hunter Spider, the titanic warrior Steel Massimo, the operator with huge intelligence Nana, the ninja thief Marino, the nurse with built-in force metal generator Cinnamon, and eventually Zero and Axel as well. You'll gradually uncover the Rebellion's plans and learn more about their endgame, that being the refining of Super Force Metal smaller than regular metals, but orders of magnitude more potent, which could possibly lead to outright invincible reploids. This comes to a head with X and company defeating Epsilon and his cadre, his closest lieutenants, and learning entirely too late that Commander Redips had played them for suckers, that the friend they thought had committed a heroic sacrifice for the Resistance's cause had in fact been playing them the entire time to steal Epsilon's refined super force metals in order to force reploids into a new stage of evolution. Casual reminder, anyone who talks about evolution, particularly induced evolution, will always, always, always be the villain. Seriously. That aside, it culminates in the Resistance team squaring off against a towering god machine, as Redips reveals that Giga City had been both a focal point of copy chip research and possibly even the place of his own origin, as it's revealed that he is a copy chip reploid himself. Ultimately, with a team play from a penitent member of Epsilon's cadre, X and friends defeat the madman and by taking shelter inside some rubble as it falls back to Earth, survive their encounter with the literal deus ex machina. To hit every plot point in command mission would be time consuming. So to hit things that matter the most is the grand scheme of things, Axel's first appearance in the game helps clarify some details. As said, copy chip reploids have been researched extensively in Giga City and the field is very specialized and the R&D for such things very much kept on a hush-hush basis. But it's clear, particularly in the area where you're forced to refight the bosses in proper Mega Man fashion, that the copy chip reploids are becoming much more commonplace. Which leads quite nicely into the next game, full title, Mega Man X8 Paradise Lost. Yes, X8 has a subtitle. X8 kicks off with X investigating the logistically improbable orbital elevator, the Jacob Project. There, X witnesses a crash landing of an elevator car, somewhat foreshadowing the next few hours of his life, and from inside emerges an army of Sigmas. However, it turns out to not be the most butt-chinned invasion of all time, but a series of copy chip reploids, here called Next Generation Reploids, the chief among them being Lumine, the strange androgynous director of the entire Jacob Project. 
There, he explains, oh, by the way, this guy's a dude, by the way, that copy chip reploids enjoy complete, absolute virus immunity, and thus even copying the DNA of someone as dangerous and unstable as Sigma poses no real risk to them. X is unconvinced, but has to let the issue go, as Alia contacts that a Maverick signal is not far away. X and Axel go to intercept a Maverick reading at Point Galapagos, where they have to deal with a giant enemy crab based on actual Japanese history. And yes, I still love that meme. Eventually, after cycling through all three heroes and learning the gameplay basics, we're then shown the return of series staple Vile, as he kidnaps Lumine with the declaration that the very stars will soon belong to the Reploids, along with a new world beginning. After reporting these events to HQ and getting introduced to the new operators, Layer and Pallet, the game begins as eight Maverick readings come upon radar, and the Hunters are forced back into action. Mechanically, I'd argue X8 is like the most sophisticated and enjoyable of all X games in the series, lacking only the level variability of X1 to ice the cake quite perfectly. That being said, let's dig into juicy dialogue. For starters, we see a certain affinity between Hunter and their corresponding operators, especially early on as X laments that this is the beginning of a new war. Alia falls silent in solidarity with X's hesitation, but Axel proclaims, just the thought of wiping the floor with those Mavericks makes my trigger finger itch, which causes Alia to begin to call him out, but X stops her, claiming there's no time for hesitation and the Mavericks are causing havoc already, and they have to deal with them. Then, when you begin beating bosses, you start getting interesting tidbits, like X's exchange with Dark Mantis, X accusing him of going Maverick and being met by a dismissive, we new generation Reploids can't go Maverick. But when X challenges him as to why he's still running weapons, he gets blown off because an old-style Reploid like you wouldn't understand. Several of the bosses use this line of reasoning with a dash of moral relativism to dismiss a lot of the Hunter's claims, as we'll soon see. Last for X is his exchange with Bamboo Pandemonium, which ends up being interesting regardless under the circumstances at Q's. The giant panda Reploid quizzes X, asking, Did you know the earliest form of rocketry was missiles used for war? Initially, X remains silent, but gets pressed further as the boss goes on, either claiming that history is one long arms race for superior weapons, or that their advent led the world to chaos. Either way, X calls him Maverick, asking if that's what Sigma thinks, too. In reply, Pandemonium insists the world itself wishes for its own destruction, that it's inevitable, and that the clash they're having is merely the result of this inevitability. Zero, meanwhile, has quite curious chats with the likes of Optic Sunflower, who implies Zero might have a hunch to Sigma's plan, but he denies he does, retorting with, what would I know about how you Mavericks think, before Sunflower cryptically implies that Zero might have once stood at the apex of Mavericks, but now lacks the potential to do so. Against Avalanche Yeti, the Mavericks even ask Zero to respectfully leave them be, that he might have the wrong idea. Zero balks at that notion, exclaiming, I could never understand the ideals of Maverick Slime leaving Yeti to lament that Zero could not change the world with that line of thinking, leaving the Red Hunter to fire back. Change the world with destruction? Leave it to a Maverick to come up with that. Then, Axel gets some interesting exchanges as well, such as when he meets Dark Mantis. When Axel accuses him of being Maverick, Dark Mantis reminds Axel, that's not possible. Copy chip Reploids can't do that. So Axel simply responds, if you're not a Maverick, then just knock off the evil doing and we'll call it a day. To which Dark Mantis calls Axel innocent and admits that he's jealous in a way. This is significant for reasons I'll bite into here in just a minute. After all eight Mavericks are dealt with, Alia reveals that the difference in Axel's copy chip, the prototypical build of said chip, and the one found in the Maverick creates an image very reminiscent of Sigma. Precisely what this means, she can't say, but it's clear that it's not a good sign. And as if on cue, Sigma arrives to deliver his farewell address, claiming that Earth and the old world of Reploids has outlived its usefulness, and that space is the next evolutionary step for the next generation Reploids. Thus, the heroes take the orbital elevator up to the moon, where they have their final battle against Vile and break into Sigma's full-on moon fortress. There, we defeat Copy Sigma and refight the Mavericks, each one reverting to a Copy Chip Reploid upon their defeat, causing Alia to speculate that it's more than Sigma controlling them, they all seem to be Sigma. And then, in the final confrontation with the big guy himself, the heroes defeat him, queuing up a condescending Lumine who taunts the heroes with, Now that you've defeated Sigma, I suppose you're satisfied. And after a scuffle against the strange, lanky opponent, Lumine confesses that new Reploids have the power to go Maverick at will, to consciously choose to rebel against law, civilization, and more. The three team up and ultimately defeat Lumine, who insists they're not even fully aware of what the future holds, and that they've changed nothing. 
After a parting blow to Axel's helmet, Lumine is destroyed utterly. En route back to Earth, Zero considers that a Sigma really is gone forever. It could mean that he might not have to fight anymore. Then he reassures X, stating simply that becoming Sigma can't possibly be seen as evolution, and that if there were ever a time that did come that would render them obsolete, the only course of action would be push back against it and win. This brings the X series proper to its close. Plot-wise, Mega Man X8 is a not-too-subtle metaphor using a lot of Christian symbolism and references, and I'll do my best to break this down accordingly. The original Paradise Lost, from which we get the subtitle, is an epic written by John Milton in the 17th century. It's a blank verse poem which, at part, speaks at how Satan and one-third of the hosts of heaven rebelled against God, a very clear parallel to how Lumine is leading hosts of the new generation Reploids to rebel against humankind. The Jacob Project itself is an equally unsubtle reference to Jacob's Ladder, a visual representation of the path angels use to move between heaven and earth. To say nothing of the opening stage being Noah's Park, a none too subtle nod to the biblical story of Noah's Ark, or even things like Bamboo Pandemonium's entire name. This game is simply saturated with such imagery, and even the phrase Power to Go Maverick at Will, which originally I waved off as being anime speak for making it sound more dramatic than it really is, is actually slathered in that self same Christian symbolism. The unrepentant and corrupt Mavericks actively choose to embrace being Mavericks, to embrace lives of evil and fall from grace much as mankind did in the creation story of Genesis. The idea being that much as humans made by God had to have free will to embrace God of their own accord ran the risk of choosing to reject him. The Reploids, made by man, if given free will, must have the potential to reject humanity in exactly the same way. Rather than being infected by a virus, like an X5, or political fugitives, like an X4, or victims of circumstances, like those in X6 and X7, these are the Reploids who have actively rejected the love of their creators, much as Satan did when he rebelled against God in Paradise Lost. Thus, in this context, rather than putting down political dissidents, X, Zero, and Axel serve as angels of vengeance, striking down an unambiguously evil but conscious decision made by their enemies. In fact, if I wanted to stretch this metaphor even further, the three hunters themselves reflect the states of grace, X being the saint, the one who embraces good of his own free will, Zero being the prodigal son, the sinner who repented and now stands for good, and Axel being the first of a next generation, too young to consciously make this decision at this phase of life, but one who is actively pursuing good for good's sake. The chip Lumine implanted on him in the epilogue very well could be a metaphor for something akin to, say, the Mark of the Beast from the Book of Revelation, but now I'm just way off in speculation at this point. Seeing as how X and many other appearances, like the Mega Man Zero series and his official artwork in Teppan, have a lot of messianic dressings, such as a digital halo which orbits his head, I don't think this is even that much of a stretch. All sermons aside, X8 is a fantastic game which left off on an enormous cliffhanger and the bad reputation of X6 and X7, and that's likely the reason more people haven't seen this for themselves. But with the Legacy Collections now available on literally everything in Command Mission's side story and nature, there's really no reason not to embrace them, especially as X8 in particular has a robust New Game Plus mode with lots of unlockables and collectibles, even the ability to unlock Alia, Layer, and Palette as playable characters in their own rights. Now, as said, this is something of the Axel trilogy of games, the strong exploration of the implications of Reploid DNA as it was first introduced in X6 and the copy chips. But what are they in practice? Essentially, it's a shape-changing Reploid capable of copying Reploid DNA, as I discussed to the best of my ability in Part 2, in order to transform into that Reploid perfectly, both in appearance and in functionality. The material science behind this, while sketchy, would lead to a new industrial revolution. The ability to do this while making much smaller, cheaper copy chip Reploids who can just copy the forms of bigger, stronger, more specialized Reploids in order to fill those work roles would revolutionize the way Reploids were made and how they related to the world around them. It really is a technology that could change the world, no questions asked. Now, why they decided to add Sigma's DNA into the mix is a huge question that I'd sure like answered, but as of the epilogue of X8 rather grimly declared, even though the new generation copy chip Reploids should have been cancelled and ceased immediately, they ended up being too useful, and they were soon back in full production again, despite people seeing the chaos that they could cause. Now, where this will lead, we may never know. The game was released in 2004, and it's kind of been a while since then. 
We have no idea if Capcom will pursue the X-Series again or not, but man, I sure hope they do. Where are we not yet, fans? We're not quite done yet. While we've covered the main X titles, there are some that we haven't. So join me here next time as we delve into the Game Boy Color, Mega Man X stream titles, spin-offs, cameos, and Easter eggs that the X games got elsewhere. All that in the final character breakdowns await you there, and I will see you there. Ready. Just hearing the word space rocket is so nostalgic. How romantic. Oh, sorry. Anyway, don't worry. I'll navigate properly.